Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. We are currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Ora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I pay my respects to those who have cared and continue to care for the country, and for those of you who are joining us remotely, I also acknowledge and pay respects to the elders past, present, and future of the country on which you are on. As much as any other single development, China's rise over the several decades has remade the landscape of global politics. Beginning with its entry into the World Trade Organization in December of 20, 2001, China has transformed global supply chains, but also international diplomacy, leveraging its success to become the primary trading and development partner from, for emerging economies the world over. But Beijing's emergence as a global power has also created tensions. Early expectations that China's integration into the global economy would make it a responsible stakeholder and lead to liberalization at home and moderation abroad have proven overly optimistic, especially since President Xi Jinping rose to power in 2012. The hopes of a so-called quiet rise have given way to a more vocal expression of great power aspirations and a more assertive international posture. Combined with Beijing's military, military modernization program, this has put the broader Indo-Pacific and even more distant regions on notice that China's economic power uh, has geopolitical implications. All of these trends are now likely to gather momentum as Xi has been reappointed to an unprecedented third term as Communist Party chairman, breaking the president that was set during uh, China's reform and opening period. As a result, in its newly released national security and defense strategies, the White House made it clear it considers China the most consequential strategic competitor and a pacing challenge offering a vision how to win a managed competition with the PRC. So against this backdrop, Professor Hal Brands and his co-author, Professor Michael Beckley, have recently published a book entitled Danger Zone, The Coming Conflict with China, that puts forward a persuasive argument in the debate over the acuteness of the China challenge for the US foreign policy. Their argument is that the rest of this decade will be the most intense and definitive decade in US-China competition. And in a couple of moments, we'll hear from Hal why he believes this is the case and what strategic implications follow from this very premise. But before I yield the floor, um, I'll just briefly introduce Hal. He is the Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He is also a columnist uh, for the Bloomberg Opinion. Um, prior to some of these engagements, he served as a special assistant for the Secretary of Defense for Strategic Planning um, in the late years of the Obama administration. And he has also served as lead writer for the Commission on the National Defense Strategy for the United States and has consulted with a range of government offices and agencies in the, in the intelligence and national security communities. And this is actually the second time we are talking uh, this year uh, to launch yet another book. So Hal is making us all look very bad. So uh, it was only in February that we spoke about The Twilight Zone, which was a single authored, authored monograph. And now, as I said, uh, we have uh, The Danger Zone, uh, which is co-authored with Michael Beckley of Tufts. And Hal, I believe that uh, both of your books this year share a name with either a video game or a board game. So well done on that uh, interdisciplinary sort of uh, um, merging of, of uh, you know, everything geopol and uh, potentially fun and scary. Um, anyway, I'll uh, walk over and we'll start the discussion. Turn mine, I think I'm good. I turned mine on, yeah. Perfect. Okay, right. we can talk now. Um, so 
I'll, I'll hope that the mic doesn't fall off or something um, horrible doesn't happen. Um, so I already, uh, first of all, welcome to Thank you for having University, me. To uh, finally. Um, so um, I wanted to start off by congratulating you on getting a shout out in the national security strategy. I don't know if, you know, uh, you got some... I'm not sure if that's how they, they see it, okay. but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. But yeah. what I mean is, so uh, if you haven't been paying attention, which hopefully you have, um, if you are interested in all things um, US foreign policy, the national St security strategy that was published um, on October the 12th, I believe uh, is the date, or it was October 13th over here because we get everything sort of late and in advance at the same time. Um, it basically said that um, the United States is uh, together with the world at a moment of inflection and that this is the decisive uh, decade for the United States when it comes to its relations with China, which is actually, if you had to sum up the argument that you and Michael make in this, uh, what I think is a great book, uh, it's this particular uh, uh, point on temporality of, yeah. of threat, um, given that obviously this is set in, in the kind of longer debate over uh, whether we are looking at a marathon or a sprint and so on. And we can um, talk more about that in a second, but could you tell us what makes this a decisive decade? Is it something that's structural? Is it more agent-based? Um, how did you go about um, thinking about this particular issue? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to tackle that. And thank you for having me. It's it's a lot of fun to, to be here, particularly in, in person. Uh, the, one, the one thing I should note relative to the introduction is that uh, Twilight Struggle was actually meant to capture the, the teen angst uh, audience. It was meant to make people think of the Twilight Saga and, and hopefully so they, they would buy it. They would confuse it with that on Amazon and, and buy it accordingly. Um, th this book, obviously, we're trying to ride the the Top Gun Maverick wave. Uh, but the to get to your to your question, I think kind of the the short version of the argument of the book, which which taps in pretty well the question that you asked, is that uh, this decade is going to be decisive um, because China is a country that is more dangerous than we might think as a result of having more problems than we might think. And so so China's rise over the past, uh, 30 or 40 years is is real. It's had phenomenal manifestations economically, diplomatically, militarily. Parts of that rise, particularly the military rise, continue, but um, it's going to be increasingly difficult for China to in achieve some of the international ambitions it has laid out because it's confronting two really big sets of problems. And the first set of problems um, kind of falls under the category of economic stagnation. And, and so a short way of putting this is that all of the forces, demographic, economic policy, uh, political reform, availability of resources, so on and so forth, that allowed China's seemingly miraculous economic rise uh, in the three or so decades after the beginning of the reform and opening period in 1978, all of those things have, have turned around. And so, so forces that used to be tailwinds are now headwinds that are gonna make it harder for China to grow at anything approximating um, a rate that its leaders would have considered satisfactory even five or 10 years ago. Uh, this is not just a story about COVID zero, although COVID zero continues to act as an acute force that, that is um, creating drag on the Chinese economy. It's the result of deeper structural factors. And I'm happy to talk more about what those would, would be. The second category of problems you might consider econ, uh, strategic encirclement. And, and so this is an old story in international affairs. Countries become more powerful, they become more ambitious. As they become more ambitious, they start behaving more assertively. And as they behave more assertively, they start creating more enemies and rivals that are fearful of their rise and start pushing back. And, and you can certainly see this uh, with China. You can see it in the, the institutions like AUKUS and the Quad that have taken shape to try to constrain China's rise. You can see it in the way that the countries really throughout the region are working more closely with the United States and with each other to try to balance Chinese power, whether diplomatically, economically, uh, or militarily. Uh, you can see it in a whole array of, of manifestations. And so the result of this is that it's going to become harder and harder for China to, to do the things that it wants to do without violence. And, and so for instance, it's going to become harder and harder for China to become the, the preeminent power in the Asia Pacific. It's going to be harder and harder for China over time 
to uh, achieve peaceful unification with Taiwan. It's going to be very difficult for China to overtake the United States economically as the leading power uh, in the world. The problem, though, is that uh, historically, when this happens, uh, and revisionist powers, so countries that want to change the international order, they become most dangerous not when they are kind of rising confidently, but when they peak and start to decline. That's when they become willing to take greater risks, especially military risks. And you can see that in various cases in history, like pre-World War I Germany. And so the reason this decade is, is going to be so decisive is that in the latter part of this decade in particular, China is going to have a very attempting window of military opportunity, particularly in the Taiwan Strait. The military balance of power will be as favorable to China at that point as it ever will be. And on the other side of that, there are going to be deepening economic and strategic problems. And so, so our concern is that China will, will be, particularly under Xi Jinping, will become increasingly likely to pursue high risk strategies to take advantage of this window of opportunity while it while it still exists. And, and so you asked in the beginning, you know, is this a structural explanation? Is it, is it an explanation about personality? It, it's a little bit of both of, in the sense that we certainly don't deny that the rise of Xi Jinping and the way that Xi Jinping has entrenched himself in power has both increased kind of the risk acceptance tendencies in Chinese foreign policy, while also increasing the long-term problems that China faces. But I'd say it's primarily a structural argument. It's an argument about how changes in the international balance of power, how windows of opportunity and vulnerability affect a state's behavior. And, and one of the ways you can tell it's a structuralist argument is that we go back into the past and try to identify other cases where this has happened as well. Great, and that's a, a great segue into then the follow-up, um, which would be, how is this different from the uh, infamous Thucydides yeah. trap thesis? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and how much time do we have? Uh, an hour and 15 minutes. So, so th I guess think, think of it this way. The, the Thucydides trap thesis, this is, this is an argument um, put forward by a political scientist at, at Harvard named Graham Allison. Basically goes like this. China is going to overtake the United States as the world's preeminent power. And so look out, right? And our argument is that China's not going to overtake the United States as the world's preeminent power, so look out, right? And, and so um, they're, they're both sort of pessimistic views of where the international system is going or may be going. I, th I think Mike and I are far more optimistic that the United States and uh, friendly and allied countries like Australia can prevail in this competition over the long term so long as they can get through uh, this, this period of peak danger during the present decade. Um, but it's also, there, there's sort of a theoretical quarrel between us as, as well in the sense that, you know, I think Graham's argument is that um, the moment of internet, the moment of danger becomes greatest when an ascending power overtakes a declining power. You get what political scientists call a power transition or a hegemonic transition. And that's when great big wars break out. Um, and our argument is that actually, if you look at you know, everything from like the history of the Peloponnesian War, which is where the, the, the Thucydides trap idea comes from, to the history of World War I and World War II, that's, that's typically not how it actually happens. What often happens is that the rising power, the revisionist power, starts to realize that it's not going to overtake the other side naturally and says, so it says, okay, let's roll the dice now and use force to try to grab what we can while we still can. And, and so there's a little bit of kind of a, a nuanced explanation of, of what type of rise and fall dynamics produce conflict in the first place. Great, and so whoever wanted this sort of uh, um, engagement with the, the kind of theories on power transition versus power balance and, and kind of the Old Testament and New Testament in international relations, I think this is a very good uh, succinct explanation of how this argument importantly, how it differs from uh, the, the, the famous to, to city these uh, a trap that I think you know there, you can't be talking about U.S. China relations without uh, that being evoked as as a thesis. But I think it's really important to to clarify things on a theoretical matter, but also to present that empirics, which you definitely do by referring to the long history and also by. Um, you know, referencing that maybe even Peloponnesian wars were not necessarily about the Thucydides trap right. as we, the way that we yeah. see it. So Athens and Sparta not necessarily kind of uh, being the models uh, for that. But then um, if, if China really uh, feels like the time is not on its side, um, 
the rationale to act? Um, is it purely then about this sort of let's let's do it because it's going to be too late come 2030? Or could it also be something that has to do with domestic situation? You did say the argument oh. is primarily structural, but could could this be something that we think of more as a diversionary war? Um, you know, obviously a lot of uh, legitimacy that the CCP has is based on the, the kind of economic prosperity yeah. and strength. So as that declines, as you say, do, do, do we um, kind of see that or do you and Michael envisage that to be part of that? Um, or do you just feel that really what is going to propel it is seeing what you have described as the conflation of these adverse foreign developments and really needing to react and this potentially then coinciding with something that could be the end of Xi's third term around 27 and, and so on. I know this is a dog's breakfast, but <laughs> hopefully. Um, no, I, it, it's, it's, it's right on the money in the sense that there is a, there's absolutely a regime type component to the explanation. And, and so in the, I guess you might call it quasi theoretical part of the book, one of the things we do is look back at every case of a, a peaking power. So, so a country that had been growing sig economically significantly faster than the world average for at least seven years and then slowed down by at least 50 percent i think it is over over the seven years after that and in every case over about the last 150 years you get some version of our explanation you, you get countries that start behaving in a more prickly insecure and assertive fashion. And it applies even to countries like the United States uh, at the turn of the, the, 20, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And, and the reason for this is that, you know, during good times, um, countries, they get used to living the, the good life, right? Citizens get used to a certain level of, of affluence. Governments make big promises about what the countries are going to achieve at, at home and abroad. You start behaving more assertively. And so you make other countries around you more nervous. And then when economic growth tails off, you find yourself in a pretty tricky situation. And so governments worry that they're now in danger of not being able to fulfill the promises that you've, you've made. The countries that you antagonized when you were rising are now in a stronger position to, to get you back. And so in, in every one of these cases, you see some, some version of this behavior, but it's, it's conditioned by a couple of factors. And, and so um, one of them, which I won't go into for into a lot of detail here, is kind of like trade expectations. And so how how open is the international economy and what sort of access do you have to it? The, the better your trade expectations are, the less likely you are to become radically violent as a result of the, the peaking power trap. Everybody's got to have a trap. Uh, and, and the second um, uh, variable would, would be the, the nature of the regime, right? And, and so democratic societies tend to be better at dealing with this sort of problem than autocratic regimes do because the fall is harder for autocratic regimes. And so that's kind of the, the theoretical reason that you should expect China um, to, to be a little bit prickly during the coming decade. But you, 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 know, you, know, you actually don't even need kind of the theoretical explanation. If you look at just sort of the evolution of the Chinese Communist Party's relationship to Chinese society over the past three or four decades, you, you see a couple of things. And, and so one, the, the CCP absolutely has made these huge promises to the Chinese people in terms of what China will be able to accomplish in the coming decades, achieving the, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, make, making China the most powerful country in Asia in the world, and so on and so forth. And so any time you're in danger of disappointing uh, expectations you've created, that's a bad thing. But the other piece is, is that over really since Tiananmen Square in particular, um, you know, the CCP does not have, has never had a, the sort of legitimacy that comes from subjecting yourself to free and fair elections, the sort of legitimacy that, you know, the government of Australia or the government of the United States does. But it, but it has had legitimacy from, from two other sources. And so one is kind of performance-based legitimacy. If you can grow the economy at, you know, 8 to 14 percent a year, and you can ensure that um, you know, the average 30-year-old in China is going to lead a, lead a dramatically better life in a material sense and in a variety of other senses than their parents or grandparents did. You can get a degree of legitimacy from that. And the other pillar of it has been 
sort of positioning itself as the custodian of, of Chinese nationalism, right? And, and so sort of nationalist education, nationalist appeals really ticked up after uh, the late 1980s. Now, the problem is if you lose that performance-based legitimacy because the Chinese economy is, is really in, in fairly dire shape right now, what do you do? Well, you probably lean harder on the other pillar, which is the nationalism component. And there's lots of evidence of that today as well. So I want to just get us maybe um, a bit out of the, the region and, and to think about uh, what China is learning and, and uh, what it's been doing, especially given I, I said we talked last in February, February 10th. Um, so two weeks before the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And- Let's hope um, that's not an omen. Exactly, in two weeks time, I <laughs> hope everyone is safe and no other regions become an opening, even though you've been talking about that. And I wanna ask you about these sort of two theater, three theater wars and so on. But um, to get back also to the national security strategy and the national defense strategy, um, it's very clear the documents say China is the strategic challenge, right? It's a facing uh, a sort of challenge. Russia needs to be constrained, but it's an acute threat. Um, surprisingly, the documents don't talk too much about this whole entente going on between the two. And uh, certainly, you know, we know now for the, the past eight, nine months uh, that, that this war has been going on in Ukraine, there have been different signals out of Beijing over their relative happiness or unhappiness with, with what's been going on. So from your end, um, what do you think, because obviously the, the kind of um, scenario that you present and talk about in the book is one about Taiwan, and there have been plenty of these analogies that have been drawn between um, Ukraine and, and Taiwan. Um, what do you think China has learned then? What are the implications? Would you say the calculations are still the same, that the structural factors, again, would prevail? Or has what Russia has been doing um, pretty badly on the strategic level, right? Uh, certainly, it, it hasn't gone according to plan uh, uh, in, a, in a way that Putin thought this would be a kind of successful blitz and, and everything would be pretty much sorted by the end of February. Um, what, how, how would you say this uh, uh, impacts the, the um, CCP's thinking, but she's potentially even more um, on Taiwan? Yeah, so maybe just kind of two prefatory comments before I, I kind of answer it substantively. The the first is that um, we don't really know, right? And and so the 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 Chinese system, parts of the Chinese system will do a formal lessons learned process from Ukraine. So so the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, has a long history, just like most militaries do, of of doing reviews of other people's wars to try to figure out what they teach about conflicts that China might face. They, they did this after the Persian Gulf War, which in many ways was kind of the foundation of, or the Chinese response to that was the foundation of China's military strategy. Today, they did it after the Kosovo War and, and so on and so forth. They'll do it after this war as, as well. And, and parts of that debate obviously will happen in private, but parts of it will actually play out in ways that sinologists can, can monitor. It'll play out in you know doctrinal public, publications and military journals and things like that. And people will be able to observe that and try to make sense of, of how the PLA is making sense of the Ukraine war. But I, but I think when people ask that question, what they're really asking is what has Xi Jinping learned from, from the Ukraine war? Because that's the, the question that matters most in terms of thinking about future Chinese decision-making as the system becomes more and more centralized. And the answer is just that we, we don't know, right? And so the Chinese system has always been opaque. It is a lot more opaque now than it was, say, 15 years ago. Um, there is, I think, real uncertainty in many democratic countries about even who is influential with Xi Jinping, let alone what they tell him. You know, there's real uncertainty about whether uh, you know top commanders in the PLA give Xi Jinping the answers they think he wants to hear or the answers they think he needs to hear. Right when he asks questions about PLA capabilities. So that's that's one caveat. And the second caveat, I guess, would just be that while I, I think I, I do believe that what happens in Ukraine very much matters to decision making around Taiwan, I, I still think it matters mostly at the margin that 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 Xi Jinping will make the decisions he makes about Taiwan primarily on the basis of factors that have relatively little to do with 
Ukraine, but it does matter at, at the margin. And if we're thinking about you know, what, what Xi Jinping, people around him might have learned from this conflict, I, I think there's kind of an optimistic view and a pessimistic view. And, and on the optimistic side, there's a variety of things that have been revealed in this war that, that you would think like they must make Xi Jinping a little bit more cautious about rolling the dice on, on Taiwan. And so, so he has learned, for instance, just how good you know US and other countries intelligence capabilities can be not in all cases but but in some cases when they're really focused uh, on a problem and that presumably you know impacts his expectations about what degree of strategic and tactical surprise he would have going into an attack on Taiwan um he he's probably been a little bit surprised by the relative unity of uh, democratic countries, not just in the transatlantic community, but also in this part of the world as well. I mean, that's one of the things I think that's really notable about the response to Ukraine. It's it's not just sort of the, the usual US and European suspects, it's Australia and Japan and Taiwan and, and some other countries uh, as well. I'm, I'm sure he's noticed, as, as you pointed out, that the Russians have done just very badly militarily, that there are um, big advantages to the defense if you're a committed defender and, and so on and so forth. And so that's kind of the optimistic narrative but I, I think it, it has to be acknowledged that there's a more pessimistic interpretation as well, which in my mind is, is just as plausible. Um, and so one lesson that Xi Jinping could have learned from Ukraine is that nuclear coercion is a great idea, that, that it works pretty well. Because in his mind, if uh, Russia didn't have a really impressive strategic and tactical nu nuclear arsenal, maybe the United States would be fighting alongside Ukrainian forces uh, right now. Um, he, he is probably, um, uh, well, I'll, let me put this to the He may not believe that the situations are as analogous as we might like to think. And, and so Xi Jinping, uh, if he believed that Taiwan does not have the will to resist in the way that Ukraine does, he wouldn't be the only person who thinks that. There's a lot of concern about that in the United States and, and in other democratic countries as, as well. He may not believe that the United States and other countries would be as aggressive in sanctioning China as they have been in sanctioning Russia, because China is just a much harder sanctions target and, and so on and so forth. And, and so you can also talk yourself into an interpretation where Xi Jinping concludes that, hey, Putin's mistake wasn't invading Ukraine. It was invading Ukraine incompetently with sort of a goofy military plan that had no, no possibility of, of working. It's, it's really you know, hard for me to give a definitive answer about you know, which way it's 51, 49 in, in his mind, I would just be guessing about that. But I, the, the fact that you can make the pessimistic case as well just kind of leads me to conclude that it's, it's probably dangerous for us to think that, okay, he's going to be deterred from invading Taiwan because Ukraine didn't turn out well for Russia. Um, and maybe some of those notes that, that you made earlier about, um, you know, belief in, in the competence of your own uh, military when um, things are maybe geared to kind of give out stories and, and portray things as much rosier than uh, they normally uh, would be. I mean, this is something that in authoritarian systems yeah. particularly uh, becomes a problem and, and um, there's a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, evidence to that, that particular issue um, in Russia. So potentially also some parallels um, that, that could be drawn with um, the PLA and with China in general. Uh, now, getting back to, to uh, still to the NSS and NDS and thinking about the US side of things, um, it's quite clear that uh, all the while uh, when US talks about or the incumbent administration talks about outcompeting China, it still leaves that space somewhere for potential um, talks mm -hmm. over things that it deems uh, of, of uh, great importance for global governance, climate, global health, um, you know, things like uh, battling uh, illegal narcotics, non-proliferation, uh, various other things, uh, stabilizing the, the kind of world economy and so on. And so this issue of compartmentalization um, is one that has really uh, not, not kind of uh, sounded all that great with people who think that the US should be more serious um, about uh, the way that it tackles this long-term pacing challenge. Um, 
what are your thoughts? And then we can start getting into more of the kind of specifics into um, how the US is preparing itself and what the allies are, are doing before we open it up because we have a sure. probably impatient audience. Um, so I'm a fan of compartmentalization uh, and just because I think that there is a, a suspicion, uh, and I say suspicion because people who were there dispute this, but that the United States sort of failed to compartmentalize in dealing with China for a long time, particularly when you got into kind of the early and mid 2010s and the issue of um, sort of the US-China bilateral negotiations that led to the Paris uh, Accords were coming to the fore. And, and there was a widespread suspicion that, that one of the reasons that the Obama administration hesitated to, to push back um, more firmly against Chinese expansion in the South China Sea, for instance, was fear of disrupting talks on uh, climate and, and other issues. And, and so whether because the Chinese demanded it or we did it to ourselves, you had a form of linkage there that didn't pay dividends for the United States um, or you know the Philippines or other countries in the South China Sea geopolitically. And so I, I think that compartmentalization is a smart way to go. There's a, there's a history of doing this effectively. The United States and the Soviet Union occasionally managed to do it during the Cold War on issues like smallpox eradication or arms control or a variety of other things. Um, the, the problem is that um, the Chinese government isn't having it right, right now. And so there, there's sort of a philosophical disagreement about how the competitive relationship works. And so the, the Biden administration's view is we're going to do the things we need to do to be competitive vis-a-vis -vis China. And we are simultaneously going to try to engage China on issues that we both care about or ought to care about. And, and you gave the list. And these two things have nothing to do with each other, and we should be able to we should be able to compete while also cooperating. And the Chinese said, "Well, of course you'd like that, right?" And and so their their view is, you know, I think the one way it was put was, "You can't have an oasis of cooperation in the middle of a desert of competition, or, or something similarly uh, evocative." Basically, making the argument that if you want our cooperation on climate and other issues, you basically have to set conditions for that by being nice to us on Hong Kong and Taiwan and Xinjiang and a variety of other issues where the United States is pursuing policies that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like. And, and where we are right now is that neither side has been able to budge the other side off of that initial preference. And you got the, the most recent example of this uh, in August when the Chinese uh, shut down the climate dialogue after Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. There wasn't much happening in that channel anyways, but but nonetheless, it was sort of a symbolic manifestation of of this clash of views of the relationship. And and so, you know, I'm I'm fairly pessimistic that we'll get anywhere on a lot of these issues in the near term. But I, but I would say, um, you know, a couple of things. And so one is that I think the Biden administration's new theory of the case here is that if China basically is seen to be punishing the planet in a climate change sense because it doesn't like what the United States is doing in the Taiwan Strait, that's going to boomerang on China diplomatically over the long term, and the costs will go up, and perhaps China will, will shift its approach. We'll we'll see, right? Um, but I think I think that's a new theory of the case. The the second point though is that um, there are some aspects of of dealing with climate change where you don't actually need kind of formal diplomatic cooperation. And so if it's just intensified investments in, you know, sources of renewable energy and things like that, right, the United States and China might, and other countries might do that simply because they think it's in their interest, and, and even because they see it as a means of competitive advantage over the other side. And so you could, you could maybe get sort of the virtuous spiral of competition here. It doesn't always have to push in a bad direction. Mm -hmm. Great. So the paradigm is one of, or the dominant paradigm is one of competition. And you just said the there are maybe two sides in, in the US in terms of how much of this space for compartmentalizing, you know, cooperating on Monday and then competing on Tuesday there is, right? Or how much um, there there needs to be actually the, the prevailing sense that we are sticking to, to one side of things. Um, what is your sense if you were to kind of draw a, a, a scorecard in terms of the the tools that the US wields, military, economic, diplomatic, um, 
how well is it faring in terms of its China strategy at the moment? Mm. Um, and then, as I said, I would like us to, to get back to, to this region and what sure. this means for allies. So um, I think that in a variety of areas, the United States is doing many of the right things, or at least is headed in the right direction, although it, it varies by issue area. And even in some of the areas where the United States is doing the right thing, it, it may not be doing it at the right uh, rate of speed or with the right level of, of urgency. And, and so just to, to pick a couple of examples, um, you know, one, one area where I don't think the United States is, is doing the right thing has to do with some of the economic instruments of, of power, right? And, and so, um, you know, as everybody here knows, the United States put a lot of effort into negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership and then decided we didn't like it anymore uh, and basically haven't been a part of it since. And, and that's clearly a demerit uh, in this part of the world when it comes to competing with China. And that's an area where I, I don't think that this administration really has any good answer to the, the problem. Um, if you look at, at other areas, and so sort of firming up either bilateral or minilateral or multilateral arrangements that are meant to push back on Chinese power, I, I think the grade is a lot higher there. And, and I think in some ways this is not surprising because alliances and partnerships have been America's secret sauce, you know, really since, since World War II. And, and so it's, it's great that we are utilizing those things today. And you can see really, really good progress in, in a variety of areas. I mean, ev everything from, you know, AUKUS, which I think was was very creative, although I think we have to be honest in saying that that was probably more of an Australian idea than an American uh, idea, to, you know, really moving very rapidly in the U.S. defense relationship with Japan to think about, you know, what roles the two countries might play if trouble breaks out in the Western Pacific. Those are just two examples. You can give lots more where I think there's been excellent progress over the last couple of years. But then maybe falling in the third category, uh, areas where the, the direction of travel is good, but the speed of travel is insufficient, I, I would put a lot of kind of the military efforts in, in this space. And, and so um, the last two national defense strategies under a Republican and a Democratic administration have both said that China is the pacing challenge for the United States, and we have to get serious very rapidly about a potential, you know, not just competition, but but no kidding, conflict breaking out uh, in the Western Pacific. Um, but if you if you look at a variety of indicators of of seriousness of that, everything from you know shifting assets from other regions into this part of the world, um, expanding production of key munitions. Um, you know, firming up the defense industrial base so that, you know, when the United States and its allies run out of stuff to shoot off relatively soon into a prospective war, they're actually able to replace it uh, relatively quickly. On, on all of those dimensions, I, I think the grade would actually have to be quite bad um, because I just, I just don't see huge amounts of progress in getting the United States ready for what may be coming. And, and I just want to be very clear about this. I'm, I'm not making this argument because like, I, I can't wait for the US and China to get into it in the Western Pacific. It's, it's precisely the opposite. If you want to deter this conflict, you unfortunately have to be ready to fight it. And I, I worry very much that that's not the case. Thanks for saying that. So if you want to have peace, prepare for war and all of that. But um, you uh, make a great point then on, on the, uh, the, the kind of credibility of, of deterrence and the seeming inability, even though there is a bipartisan consensus in the US, which these days very hard to find, but when it comes to China, at least this is what unites the left of the left and the right of the right and everything in between. Um, how do we explain this sort of, uh, you know, that, that there is a diagnosis, there seems to be a consensus. Is it just the, the standard kind of government inertia? Is it, you know, um, the, the kind of contingencies along the way that come about? And, you know, this is yeah. then the story maybe of Ukraine, where a lot of the allies in the Indo-Pacific have worried that the United States is now yet again going to be distracted, similar to, say, 2013-14, you know, kind of looking into the Middle East more after Obama announced the rebalance or the pivot. Um, 
I'm asking, you know, just from yeah. a, a perspective, not for a definitive answer, but how, how would you explain this? We have a consensus, we have, yeah. Yeah, I, so, so bureaucratic inertia is definitely part of the problem. Um, you know, the Pentagon is a two million person bureaucracy. So it, it does a lot of things well, but moving quickly is not one of them uh, in most cases. And, and so when you are trying to um, get the Pentagon to prepare for a fundamentally different era than the one it faced over, say, the previous two decades, when a lot of what the United States military was doing was counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, that, that's just going to take time. And, and there has been significant progress on that front. I mean, so if you look at the, the way that the U.S. Marine Corps plans to operate, they have just sort of fundamentally changed their conception of what that service is supposed to do to get ready for a war in the Western Pacific. And that, that's great, but I, I think that is you know, more of an isolated example than something that's representative across the department. Part of the explanation is, as, as you put it, distraction in the sense that uh, you know, the United States is a global power and stuff keeps happening in other regions. It, it could be you know, the ISIS explosion in the Middle East in 2013, 2014. It could be the invasion of Ukraine. It could be you know, the, the coming, uh, the next blow up in the Middle East, which is, is coming uh, now that the uh, Iran nuclear deal negotiations are, are dead. Um, but you know, one of the, the reasons I am um, I don't, I don't love the term distraction because I don't know that it's right to qualify the largest war that Europe has seen since World War II as a distraction. Like that, that's a big deal. And, and what it speaks to is just this larger problem, which is that the United States has a lot more commitments than it has capabilities and, and resources. And so when that's the case, you're constantly going to be distracted because vital interests you have in other regions pull, pull you away. And, and but the, so that that just kind of you know raises the question of like why are, are resources insufficient? And I think in some ways the root cause I'm going to get a little bit meta here is that um, it's just very difficult for Americans to imagine a near future in which their military is no longer dominant in basically whatever part of the world it wants to be dominant in and in which you could have you know not kind of like brush fire wars in the middle east but a a no kidding hot military conflict between the two most powerful countries in the world because it has been so long since that happened that i think it's hard for a lot of us to believe that it ever could happen, um, but but it could, right? And I think that's unfortunately the situation we're going to be getting into, uh, or the, where the danger will be rising at least over the coming five years or so. So the wake up after the era of, of unipolarity into multipolarity is, is never an easy uh, or a happy one. But um, question then, uh, one final, as I said, uh, in, in the category of uh, alliances, uh, you said the secret sauce, Certainly, the NSS recognizes that uh, uh, the power of alliances and partnerships, for that matter, um, is uh, important in terms of the, the pursuit of U.S. interests in, in being that kind of magnifying uh, force. It's interesting that compared to the interim uh, national security, strategic security guidance, um, we don't hear the talk. We hear the talk of democracy. It's everywhere, but it's maybe a bit more subdued now that there is this potential to cooperate with partners also based on the like mindedness, not necessarily on on regime type. Um, and maybe some of this has to do with uh, parts of the world that are closer here to, to us uh, in Australia, given that we know that there are certainly like-minded countries, but some of them really don't like the whole talk of democracy and, and, and uh, all that comes with them. Um, so first question, maybe a bit uh, <laughs> provocative. Um, I've heard some... Uh, even some of your colleagues from AEI, let them be unnamed, but uh, certainly put forward the idea that they don't buy um, 
the buy-in from the allies at the moment that uh, we are still you know even if we are seeing now serious talks of you know military modernization and unprecedented investment into uh, defense capabilities in Japan that Australia is undergoing this defense review that we are seeing you know uh, allies in the region cooperating among themselves uh, in a way that they haven't before right not to create a kind of regional NATO by any means but certainly to move more away from the hub and spokes system that we've had but some still wonder you know would Japan really uh, see an attack on U.S. bases um, in, in Japan as an attack on itself or would you know Koreans um, let U.S. use its own weapons and so on um, so where, where do you stand on that? Well, um, I, I think it's, as, as a general rule, uh, countries that are closer to the threat tend to feel it more acutely than countries that are farther from the, the threat. And, and so I, I think you're seeing signs of that today. And so the, the Japanese, all, all of the country, you know, so if you're talking about the US, Japan, Australia, um, none of them have a formal defense commitment to Taiwan, right? All, all of them have something approximating a policy of strategic ambiguity. Like we wouldn't like it if you attack, but we're not willing to say in advance precisely what we would do. But, but in all three cases, there are indications over the last year or two that um, all the governments are thinking very seriously about what they would do if China were to attack Taiwan. And all three governments have sent pretty strong signals, although the strength varies by capital, that they wouldn't simply stand aside and, and see it happen. Um, and in fact, I think some of the strongest signals have come from Japan, where, where leading officials have used words like existential to describe the consequences of Taiwan being conquered by, by China, which is not surprising when you think about the geography and, and how difficult a Chinese controlled Taiwan would make it for Japan to defend some of its um, furthest flung Southwestern uh, islands. Um, you have you know, seen an Australian defense minister say that it would be inconceivable that Australia would not be involved uh, in a Taiwan fight uh, from the outset. I was just, uh, just this morning reading some of the polling data that, that Jared sent over, which, which indicates that the Australian public is actually um, more keyed up for a Taiwan fight than the American public is at, at the moment. But, but even in the United States, President Biden has said, I think four times now that the United, he said sort of point blank that the United States would uh, defend, help Taiwan defend itself militarily if it were the subject of an unprovoked attack by, by China. Now in each, each case, the next day, you know, the press secretary gets to say, no, no, the president was just restating uh, current the American NSS policy. We will not support any unilateral right, right, changes yeah. to status. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. and, and so, but I, but I think you are seeing a convergence in these three countries in particular around the idea that a significant Chinese use of force in the Western Pacific, probably against Taiwan, um, would create dangers that might well be intolerable. And, and by the way, you can see hints of this even, in, you know, even when the United States isn't around. And so if you, as I'm sure you have, right, you read the text of the, the joint declaration that Australia and Japan put out recently, it kind of reads like alliance light in the sense that there's a line in there that says that they pledge to uh, consult and consider their responses to issues that might jeopardize what is it, their sovereignty or the security of the, the region? That, that sounds a lot like, you know, we're going to talk to each other and figure out what we're going to do about an attack on Taiwan or, or other things. And, and so I, I think the in some ways, you know, the, the progress is never as fast as, as you might like it. There, there are really big questions about how other countries in the region, you know, the Philippines, uh, South Korea, India, Singapore, you know, some of which are democracies, some of which are, are not really democracies might respond, but there is much more of kind of an emerging multilateral coalition around the, the defense of the Western Pacific, let, let's call it, than there would have been even three or four years ago. And maybe then a follow up, a very quick one on that. What would you say to some of these arguments that actually um, the allies might be driving a lot of 
the U.S. response in the region as well as you yeah. yourself acknowledge, yeah. you know, AUKUS, um, the, the kind of ideas being dreamed up in, in Canberra or in Tokyo rather than in D.C.? Um, our, our best allies are the ones that come up with interesting ideas and then convince us that they were our ideas to, to begin with, right? And, and that, that's an old tradition in U.S. foreign policy. And, and so, you know, most Americans who pay attention to international affairs are convinced that the United States created NATO, and it's, it's just not true, right? It was a European idea that European countries pressed on the United States. Um, and, and you can see similar tendencies today. So the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, you know, that, that was mostly a Japanese I, idea. Um, you know, the Quad kind of relates to this idea of a democratic security diamond, which is another thing that, that former Prime Minister Abe uh, talked about. Um, to the extent that the United States is now re-engaging with some of the, the smaller island nations in the South Pacific, right? I'm, I'm sure that has a lot to do with, with nudging and prodding from, from Canberra. And, and so, you know, it's the right way to think about these alliances is that influence flows both ways. And, and that's actually when the alliances work best, because there is a certain wisdom of the crowd's dynamic here. Yeah. So uh, also in, in some of these then uh, myth debunking spirit in terms of the, the, the asymmetry in the relationship always, this kind of delivers where uh, the, the kind of solutions will be flowing doesn't necessarily hold. So I said that I'm going to practice, uh, you know, strategic restraint and keep to uh, what we agreed uh, to have uh, at least half an hour for uh, the Q&A from the audience. So if uh, you do have a question, um, please raise your hand. We'll come over with the microphone. If you can identify yourself, your affiliation, and just keep it a question rather than a comment. Um, we had a gentleman over here and over there in the back. Yeah, you can go. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming here. Um, I haven't read your books, but it's too bad you don't have any here to sell. Um, I'm concerned about a number of issues, so I'm going to just touch on a few of them, and you can pick whichever ones you want to respond to. Historically, the United States have always been reluctant to enter a military conflict, World War I, World War II, um, the Korean War, and even the uh, Middle East were all triggered by dramatic events that forced the public to turn around and say, we have to do something here. Secondly, today is an election, and there is the expectation that there are going to be significant political switches. We have, sorry, I'm a dual national, but I've been here for 50 years. I'm an Australian who was born overseas. We have concerns that the perception of the leadership in the United States is not as strong as it might otherwise be. If the control of the Congress in either one house or both were to flip, then the perception globally of statements by the president of the United States will be construed in a much different light than it would have been the case had there been a resounding retention of democratic control in one or both houses. We have to wait and see, but we're only 48 hours hopefully away from that happening. Australia has gotten involved in AUKUS. Australia has got uh, a history over the last, I don't know how many years, you can help me with that, of having Marines stationed here on a rotational basis. There is now mention, and I don't know how uh, legitimate it is that there will be B-52s stationed here, or again, perhaps on a rotational basis. Defense spending and strategic and tactical spending has been widely talked about in our media. And the other thing is, and here's, this is probably the most important question. If you look at China, what priority does Taiwan play, the control of Taiwan, however that is, economic, whatever, play amongst the other major factors in China. While you do have a very strong leader, there is plenty of evidence that he doesn't carry the majority of people with him in other, any other way than through the fact that he is such a strong leader. And if you don't go with that, you're in trouble. Putin is a miniature, a miniature case study of that. So that's and, a lot of questions. Can we yeah, maybe I'll like stop. you'll we'll stop here? Thank you. Yeah. And if we could keep it brief. And sorry, your name was I didn't give you my name. Yeah. 
Uh, my name is Dan Steiner. I'm a student of international relations. I graduated a long time ago, and I have two other degrees. All right. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Ben. Yeah. Uh, that's a great set of, of questions. Um, Essay type questions. Yeah. Let me let me um, let me start with the midterm elections and concerns about U.S. leadership, and and we'll see we'll see how far I get. Uh, so, the f the first thing I think to under stand is that when it when it comes to midterm elections in general we, we just have to come in with a realistic set of expectations and, and so it's it's actually very unusual in u.s politics for the party that holds the white house to do well in midterm elections the the trend historically is is otherwise and it's especially likely to be otherwise when the party that that controls the White House also controls both branches of both houses of Congress, which is the case uh, today, it's, it's extremely unusual, except in extreme circumstances, to see that unified control of government sustained. Even more so when the margins were so relatively narrow to to begin with, and and so, you know, people can decide how they want to interpret. Uh, an outcome in which let's just say for the sake of argument that the Republicans end up with, I don't know, a 30 seat majority in the House and a two seat, two to three seat, you know, majority in the Senate. Um, you, you could interpret that as, you know, Trumpism is back and we're on the road to, you know, Trump being American president, America's president in 2025. You could also just interpret it as Midterm elections are hard for the party in power, and this is actually, by historical standards, still a pretty good showing for the Democrats, even though they lost seats in both houses because they didn't lose more. Remember, you know, Barack Obama, I think the Democrats lost, what, 60 seats in, in the House in, in 2010 and, um, you know, was eight or nine seats in the Senate. I mean, it was it was a big turnaround. So that's that's the first comment. Um, the second comment is that. I, I think the outcome of the midterm elections is likely to have relatively little impact on U.S. foreign policy. I, I think it is particularly likely to have little impact on U.S. foreign policy in this part of the world. Um, if I were sitting in Ukraine, I might be a little bit more concerned about this, but I, I actually think that sort of the, the prospect that a Republican House is going to turn off aid to Ukraine is is way overblown. I don't think that's that's going to happen. Um, in, in some ways, if you come at this from the perspective, and I'm not necessarily saying that this is the case, but if, if you come at it from my perspective, let's say, of saying, boy, I hope the United States is more effective in competing with China, you could actually tell yourself a good news story about where Republican control of at least one house and perhaps two houses of Congress takes you. It's, it's probably better in terms of getting higher levels of military spending. It's, it's probably better in terms of, you know, potentially getting um, screening of outbound investment into China and, and things like that. Uh, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of, a fair number of my, my friends who, who work uh, for the administration who wouldn't be at all displeased if they ended up with um, more Republican colleagues on the Hill because Republicans tend to be fairly hawkish on this issue. And then the third point I, was make, I would make comes back to, to Garana's point, which is that the, the one thing that unites every political faction in the United States is that they don't like China. That's true of progressive Democrats who, who don't like China based on values issues for the most part. It's true of America first Republicans who, who don't like it as an economic competitor. It's certainly true of center left and, and center right folks as, as well. And so that, that's not to say that there will be no changes in American foreign policy in the coming years, depending on, on who's in power. I, I have a lot of concerns of my own about what would happen if, if Donald Trump were to become president again in, in 2025, and I'll, I'll stipulate to that. But there's actually a, a pretty solid consensus in the United States political system on where we seem to be going in competition with China. And also, I would say, with competition with Russia as well. You may think that's a good thing. You may think it's a bad thing. But I, I actually think there is likely to be more stability in U.S. foreign policy over the coming seven or eight years than, than many other observers might say. Just like over there. <laughs> the problem of too many, <laughs> too many options. Um, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Um, my name is Jasper. I'm a student here um, in international and global studies um, and minoring in Arabic language and culture. 
Um, I find it a really interesting analysis. Um, but I think the question I would love to hear more about is about the conclusions you come to as a result of the idea that China is a a power that is kind of struggling, has reached its peak, and is, uh, in your words, I haven't read fully your book, but from what I've read and how you described it, um, kind of like naturally facing problems um, that are forcing it to decline. Um, and I, I do wonder to the degree that in our response to this being kind of remilitarization or I guess elements of that, like taking the threat more seriously, creating alliances, uh, is that not then contributing to this question of China facing, you know, weakening factors in and of itself? Like if, if those things are economic stagnation um, and strategic encirclement, obviously economic stagnation, there are internal forces within China, but the degree to which taking a threat seriously means, you know, stopping China's economic power throughout the world uh, and therefore also strategic encirclement insofar as military alliances, you know, increase that threat. Are we therefore not forcing China further into the corner uh, and is it not therefore kind of if we want to avoid conflict and bloodshed more reasonable to understand that you know china is a a country of 1.5 billion people it is inexorably going to be a huge part of our world system and does it not make more sense therefore to understand that as the us and australia have engaged in incredibly destructive subversions of international law and human will that that is going to be a part of how china works and admitting that we have done so in the past and therefore working towards a world that is unfortunately going to have to accompany those two systems is that not better than rearming and therefore pushing further for the factors that are going to push them towards war yeah that's 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 a great question so i, I think there's kind of two two pieces of it and, and so one is um and I'll, I'll just paraphrase a little bit here you know, if, if China is slowing down economically and fo forcing more problems strategically, like why not just wait and let it encounter those problems and it'll mellow out over time? Um, so that's one version of the argument you sometimes hear. And I, I think the, the, the trouble with that is that that is typically not what happens in, in these cases, per particularly when you're dealing with a country like China that that has you know what political scientists would call re revanchist ambitions right and so so China claims large swaths of land and water around it whether that's you know a big uh, chunk of land that you know India also claims whether that's Taiwan whether it's the South China Sea East China Sea so on and so forth when you have countries like that and and they start slowing down they they typically lash out in destructive ways even if it doesn't actually reverse their decline right and and so one of the the arguments we make in the book is that this is this is the proper way of seeing Germany in the run up to World War One. Obviously, Germany's effort to to break out of the strategic encirclement that it faced in 1914 didn't didn't work for, for Germany. Unfortunately, it didn't work particularly well for the for the world either. And and so countries can lash out in ways that are destructive even when they're not successful. But I think the the second part of of the argument, and, and this may have been the part you were getting at more directly, is if you have an insecure country that worries about a closing window of opportunity, then things you do to strengthen your own position may simply exacerbate that insecurity and, and make it fear that the window is closing faster. And so China goes even faster and responds, and you end up with kind of a spiral of, of tensions. And I, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, that, that is a danger. That is a danger in the analysis. Um, I, I think what you have to do in a situation like this is decide which scenario you think is, is more dangerous. Is it more dangerous to have a scenario where the United States and Australia and Japan and other countries are rapidly firming up their capabilities so they can defend themselves and their interest in the region against potential Chinese aggression, even at some risk of accentuating insecurities in Beijing? Or is it better to have a situation in which we are going out of our way to avoid exacerbating those insecurities, but the cost of doing that is leaving yourself in a weaker military position vis-a-vis -vis China. I, I think that the danger is greater in the latter case than the former case, because when I try to think about the, the world that China would build in the region and beyond if it were the most powerful actor, I, I think it looks pretty ugly. I think it looks pretty ugly from the perspective of survival of democratic norms in Taiwan and potentially beyond. I think it looks pretty ugly in terms of um, 
you know, replacing a relatively open, well-functioning international economic system with one that's much more uh, predatory and mercantilist. I, I think it, it looks pretty ugly with respect to the fates of the people who would essentially, you know, come under China, the control of the Chinese Communist Party in this scenario. And in recent months, you've had um, CCP representatives be very explicit in talking about the need for large-scale re-education of Taiwanese citizens if Taiwan were to come under the mainland's control. That, that's really not, um, that, that's a world that I would, I would very much not like to live in. And I would be willing to, to pay a fair amount and run a certain amount of risk in order to avoid that. But, but here, here is where you know, we might converge. And so there was a similar situation in the early Cold War where uh, the United States and, and other countries in NATO decided that they needed to rearm West Germany in the early 1950s. And they understood that doing so was going to look very provocative from the perspective of the Soviet Union. But they decided to do it anyways. And they decided to do it based on calculations like the one that I've just talked about. But they also said, okay, let, let's take certain Soviet insecurities seriously. And so when we rearm West Germany, let's do it in a way that basically makes it impossible for West Germany to use force offensively, independently of NATO. And we're gonna do it in a way that basically makes sure that the Germany won't get nuclear weapons, right? And, and so we are going to practice a certain amount of reassurance even as we try to deter Soviet Union. I, I think there has to be a role for some degree of assurance or reassurance in dealing with China today. And so while I think that China has offensive intentions vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, I, I also take the CCP at its word when it says that it worries that the United States and other countries are walking away from their one China policies, that it worries that Taiwan is on the glide path toward independence and, and so on and so forth. And so I would be perfectly happy to have a series of diplomatic engagements, whether publicly or privately, where the United States talks with Chinese officials and says, look, we, we do not support Taiwanese independence. We, we would take steps to try to dissuade Taiwan from going down that path. All we want is to maintain the status quo that has kept the peace for the last 40 some odd years. And, and we worry that some of your actions are making that harder to do. You know, would the Chinese listen to that? I, I have my, my doubts, but nonetheless, I think it would be worth doing precisely for the reasons that you talk about. Thank you for over there and then over here. Some more, we're making our bet to the best. And then over here. Along those lines, you were just speaking. Um, like recently, please identify yourself. Oh, sorry. My name's Peter Trusham. Yeah. And uh, I'm not really connected with the university, but I've lived in Taiwan for 20 years. So I feel I've got family and that there. So for me, it's a really important subject. And uh, I, I have noticed that there's, uh, like in the US and in Australia, the security agencies have started becoming more transparent and releasing more information. And also, I think before the Euro, uh, war in Ukraine, that happened as well, which seems to me like a bit of a, a shift to, towards transparency and openness. Um, so with what's was happening in the past was the status quo was very ambiguous and a lot of people don't understand it a lot of politicians don't understand it the average joe blow on the street wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about you know and uh the one china policy is interpreted differently by so many different countries and i i think we just had joe biden you mentioned he he said three times we'll fight if Taiwan's attacked, we'll fight. Uh, and then that's explained away as uh, a gaffe or something. But I find it hard to believe that the president of the United States would make mistakes like that. Um, I, I'm just wondering if we're coming to the realization that the, um, the status quo and the one China policy and ambiguity has got us into a bad place and that now we're paying the price with a very uh, a China that's become more powerful and is able to challenge all, all the countries on, the, uh, on that ring of islands going there, the first island chain. And if we're coming to the realization that maybe 
uh, just being honest and straightforward and claiming, you know, outright what we will do would not only help China understand where they stand, but also the people in Taiwan and the people in Australia who will be called upon, upon to fight and to give their lives. Don't they have a right to know what our government's going to do? I'll say I'm, I'm of two minds on this issue. And the, the way that this issue often gets framed in the United States is uh, a matter of strategic ambiguity versus strategic clarity. Right? And so for years and years and years, the US policy has been, uh, as, as Grona reminded us, to oppose unilateral changes in the status quo by either side, frankly, in the Taiwan Strait, without making uh, as clear as it does in formal treaty relationships what the response would be to such unilateral changes. That's strategic ambiguity. Um, and strategic... Yeah, so, so base, I mean, the, the short, that's, it, the, right, the, the short version is that it is written in U.S. law that the United States will help um, provide Taiwan with uh, tools to defend itself, and that the United States has an interest in, and I'm paraphrasing here, peace and security in the Taiwan Strait. So, so that is, um, you know, that is a, a formal statement, a codified statement to some degree of the U.S. position on the issue, but it, it's far more ambiguous than the language you would get in the North Atlantic Treaty or in the U.S.-Japan uh, um, um, Treaty or in the, the U.S.-Australia Alliance, for instance. So the debate now is, um, you know, essentially along the lines of what, what Peter asked, which is, should we shift to a position of strategic clarity where the United States simply says outright, if China attacks, we will respond with, with military force or with language uh, more akin to what you would find in some of the treaties I just referenced. I, I think there are, uh, the reason I'm of two minds on this is I think there are, there are good arguments on one side, good, good arguments on the other side, and then to a certain extent, it's, it's all academic. And, and so let me kind of walk through those three things. There's good, re the good reason, the best reason to keep the current policy is that if the United States were to, let's say, sign a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan of the sort that we had with the Republic of China between, I think, 1954 and 1979, that would appear to Beijing as a major change in the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. Um, and whether you think this is justified or not, and I do not think it is justified, it, it could, in the perspective of some China watchers, touch off the very crisis you're trying to avoid. Because China concludes that the United States is laying the groundwork for an independent Taiwan, and so we've got to use force to prevent that, as we have said we would many, many times, right? The Chinese Communist Party is, is crystal clear on that point. But there, there's another side to it. And um, earlier today, I was just thinking about um, the outbreak of, of World War I. And one of, the, one of the problems, one of the reasons why uh, the Triple Entente, Russia, France, and Britain were not able to successfully deter Germany from invading Belgium and going into France from there was that they, Britain sort of had a policy of strategic ambiguity, right? It, it had left very unclear what its commitments were to France in particular and what its response would be to a German attack as envisioned in the, the Schlieffen plan. And that gave German officials just enough of sort of a hope that Britain might stand aside in a continental war. They said, okay, let's do it. And by the time they realized that Britain would in fact come in, it was too late. So, so wars have started when uh, potential aggressors don't realize how much resistance they'll, or they'll ultimately likely to encounter until it's, it's too late. And so that I think is the strongest argument to change the policy. But, but then um, where I sometimes come down is that this is all kind of academic in the sense that when I think about Chinese calculations about the Taiwan Strait, I, I worry that what we have is not a commitment problem, but a capabilities problem. I, I, I worry that, you know, I, I think that most Chinese officials would have to assume that the United States would involve itself in a Taiwan fight, if only because the president keeps saying so. What they may doubt is that the United States has the ability to contest effectively a Chinese invasion of 
Taiwan as the military balance has has shifted. And so at the very least, I, I think any shift towards strategic clarity has to come in concert with a concerted effort to, to build up the capabilities you need to make good on that commitment. And if I have to choose between one of two things to focus on, I'd, I'd focus on the capabilities rather than the commitment. So um, if you're going to speak loudly, then make sure that you yeah. carry a big stick rather than a small one. Um, we had a question over here. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, uh, Tony Booth, a itinerant follower of US Study Center seminars, um, also a student of ANU in Chinese and Chinese history, a couple of years behind Kevin. A um, <coughs> couple of points, if I may, to our Taiwanese colleague here, Dan Gong Fu Qing, very quickly. From the Chinese questions rather than comments, because we are really getting close yeah, to okay. the Yeah, okay, well, people are taking up a lot of time. Okay. Very quickly, my conception is the Chinese see themselves as inheritors of the boundaries under the Great Qing, which included Tibet, Manchuria, including Taiwan from the 1680s. They then lost it in six, sorry, 1895 against the Japanese Navy. The Gomindang Republic of China for 40 years claimed all kinds of territories, including Mongolia, up until 2021. So all those Chinese regimes saw the boundaries as a legitimate claim. That includes Taiwan, which was under the administration of Fujian province. So therefore, when you had the United Nations form, the PRC was excluded from the club. People like Dr. Fuyu Love talk about the rules-based order, et cetera, et cetera. From their perspective, they were excluded from the club and the, the seat was given to the ROC until 1971, which looked absurd. So therefore, from their perspective, they believe our talk about Taiwan is interfering in their own internal affairs, rightly or wrongly. That's how they see it. Now, there are polls and data showing that the Taiwanese people themselves now largely believe they should be independent Clearly, they can't say that. Um, the data is freely available if you need references later on. So we have a very difficult balancing act to say our perspective is we want to impose these sort of rules where you weren't initially included, but this is how we played the game. The Chinese ambassador here gave an address where he tried to use the illusion of Tasmania being like Taiwan, and you wouldn't expect Tasmania to be separate. That was the illusion he was trying to give, or the analogy, I should say, sorry. So are we imposing a set of rules that they don't believe in? And therefore, the whole debate is, is somewhat academic, but from their perspective, you know, we're interfering with their, what they perceive to be their right. Yeah. You know, I, I don't quarrel with the view that that's how the CCP sees it. On, on Taiwan, I mean, I... I have a somewhat different interpretation. I mean, my, my view is that uh, this very large majority of the Taiwanese population now identifies as Taiwanese rather than Chinese, right? So there, there's certainly a national identity there. But when you ask, you know, in the opinion polling, do you prefer unification with China, independence, or status quo, status quo still wins, right? And, and so um, support for independence varies a lot across the political spectrum, and there's there's not sort of critical mass behind it at at the moment. Um, I I have no doubt that Xi Jinping um, and others around him feel that uh, China was in some ways excluded from the formation of the contemporary international system, and certainly they would prefer a different set of rules today if they had their druthers. Now, now the question is, you know, Xi Jinping can want whatever he wants, I can want whatever I want, right? Should we accommodate ourselves to those desires or or not? Right. And and I would I would argue that the answer is no, if we can if we can um, maintain that refusal at a reasonable price for, for reasons that I sketched out in, in responding uh, to Jasper a few moments ago. But I think it is entirely fair to, to point out that um, 
you know, the current international order was was not made by China, right? And and so of course China would want a different set of rules as it becomes more powerful. That that's the story of of history in a lot of ways. Why wouldn't a rising country want to rewrite the rules of the international system? To suit its own interests and, and values, then it becomes a question of does the rest of the world want to agree to that or not? Um, the, the other point I would I just make is, you know, I, I fundamentally agree with you in the sense that there is there are a lot of things going on in Chinese foreign policy. Just sort of traditional Chinese nationalism is is certainly one of them, right? And and so, you know, and Xi Jinping and other communist Chinese leaders talk about this. All the time, right? That the, what they when they what they talk about they don't they don't talk about the rise of China. They talk about the restoration or the rejuvenation of China, right? And it speaks to exactly the issue that you're talking about. That for most of recorded history, China was what we would now call a great power. It certainly saw itself as one of the greatest powers, if not the greatest power in the international system. And and so it shouldn't be surprising at all that as China has become more powerful over the past 30 or 40 years, it wants to, in its view, set history aright by, by restoring its place atop the international order. So the return rather than the rise, right, that whole narrative, if we take the really long kind of macro uh, trends into consideration. One final question, if we, if we could, yeah. Steve Patel, I just have an interest in international relations. Um, uh, in dealing with uh, Russia in the Ukraine and dealing with Taiwan and China, um, you're, you're playing for big dominoes. My question primarily is, and if you got into a war, if the United States got involved in a war with uh, China on over territory that China believes it's its, would the United States think it justified if it cost the United States 100, 150, 200,000 troops dead. Is it, that, is it that important? Because it could easily come to yeah. that. I mean, so there, there's, you know, there's sort of the, um, is it justified question? And then there is the, would the American people view it as being justified question? And I think it depends entirely on how the conflict starts and and so if it if it starts in an ambiguous way um and china refrains from let's say attacking u.s military bases early on and it's a hard sell for the president to rally the country to intervene in the first place and then it turns into a bloody catastrophe then i think a lot of americans would think it isn't worth it and, and we've seen that story before but imagine a different scenario. Imagine a scenario in which the war starts with not just a Chinese attack on Taiwan, but surprise missile attacks and aerial bombardment on US bases throughout the Western Pacific. And you have hundreds of American deaths on the first day of the fighting. And to Americans, it looks a lot like Pearl Harbor, right? Then I think you have solved the political will problem very quickly for the president. Now, would that will be sustained as the conflict became bloodier and bloodier? It, it, it would depend on whether the trends were seen to be positive. It would depend on whether this was seen to be a fight over the future of the entire region and perhaps the international system rather than just a fight over Taiwan. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult um, for me to give you a definitive answer. I, I do think the question is worth asking, though, because... Uh, you know, there there is a point at which almost any, uh, you know, any stake is not worth what you would ultimately pay for it, right? And so there there have been, you know, a lot of war games run in the United States about what a conflict would actually look like. Some of them you shouldn't take too seriously. Um, some of them are, are better. And there was one that was run a couple of months ago that, um, I'm sorry? No, a different one. Um, that was, you know, that indicated that the United States and Taiwan could could effectively defend the island. They could prevent China from conquering it, and all it would cost the United States is half of its global inventory of fighter and attack aircraft and two aircraft carriers and all the people who would be killed in the loss of those planes and ships. And and I think it's a reasonable question to ask. You know, at at what point would it become? too high a price to pay. And, and so it leads me back, and maybe I'll close here, on the comment that I made earlier. Um, 
I, I very much hope we are successful in deterring a conflict over Taiwan because once it starts, pretty much all the outcomes are terrible. And I might close it here because this was to me before you even said deterrence, the main takeaway. I think that this is a theme that uh, uh, runs back to February as well from the Twilight Zone, how the US was successful at fighting something that wasn't kind of a day or a night, right? Something in the middle, not quite the war, but not quite peace, but also from danger zone, it's not the ine in inevitability, right? It's something that could well be prevented and then uh, deterrence is important and making sure um, that that's done in a credible and, and clear way. What's the next book? Uh, so the, the next book is a reboot of the old Makers of Modern Strategy uh, uh, collection, which will be out in uh, May of next okay, year. Okay, so it's already, okay, yeah. so I'm just going to get clinically depressed then. Ed, the, uh, the industrial kind of production <laughs> line uh, running there at Professor Brands' office. Um, I can't thank you enough for uh, 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 giving us an hour and a half of your very busy day because I know that you're touring the region and you're departing Australia tomorrow. So thank you uh, again for that. Um, because there were questions about the midterms, we are running uh, events that are connected to uh, events, to the, sorry, midterms uh, watch. So tomorrow evening, but also on the question of Taiwan, please do uh, make sure that you come to uh, the event next Friday uh, with Bonnie Glazer, formerly from the CSIS, now with the German German Marshall Fund. Coming back to Germany, we mentioned Germany so many times today. Uh, but anyway, it also speaks to, to the kind of a transatlantic part of the, the conversation. So that will be in this very room, I believe, um, next Friday at 6 p.m. So look forward to seeing you there and then maybe unpacking some of these things that we left here. Um, but uh, please join me in thanking Professor Hal Brands of Thank you.